What a joyous time. What a beautiful, what a beautiful time it's been in terms of weather. I was telling someone I've been to Oregon several times over the years, and I think this is the best weather I've ever experienced in Oregon. All right? So yeah, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I, I think I've only seen Mount Hood once. All the times I've flown into Portland, and uh, it's either raining, cloudy, well, you know how it goes, right? Uh, but it's been great to be here on the coast and to have such good weather. We have um, been walking through kind of the five anchors. Remember the first anchor is God loves us, and that is demonstrated in how God loved us through Jesus and how God has poured the Spirit into our hearts and filled us with the love of God so that by the power of the Spirit, we experience the love of God. The second anchor is God listens. That is, God invites us to lament. God invites us to tell God our troubles, our hurts, our pains, our wounds, and to be frank and honest and uh, open-hearted about our problems with God, right, or our questions for God. And God listens. God invites us to, to speak as God listens. And we see that in Jesus Christ as well. That Christ on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting a Psalm 22, a lament psalm. And then yesterday we talked about God reigns, or the uh, Saturday night, I guess it was, that God reigns, and that that's one of the more difficult kind of discussions, because we, there's a lot of mystery in terms of how God reigns and why God reigns the way God reigns. And so we have questions about why, and that's part of our lament, our why questions and how long questions and what are you doing questions. And, but to affirm God reigns is to say God, God is not knocked off the throne because bad stuff happens. Even in the book of Revelation, right, we have God on the throne, even though the saints are persecuted and struggling, but God is still on the throne. And God reigns in a way that makes meaning out of what is happening to us. And that's the one where we have to learn to trust God. And we learn to trust by paying attention to the old, old story, right? By paying attention to God's track record. God has a track record in Israel and in Jesus Christ. And we see Jesus submitting to the reign of God. And having submitted, he is exalted to the right hand. So we see where the reign of God goes. It goes to the good of God's people, to the exaltation of God's people, exemplified in Jesus Christ. In this moment, we want to concentrate on the anchor that God understands, or God cares, or God knows what it's like. Sometimes we have a kind of a picture of God as very distant, and there's a sense in which God is transcendent, that God is above and beyond all things. And that there's a sense in which God is unaffected by what happens here. That is, God is not provoked. God is not codependent. Let's put it that way. God's not codependent on, on the creation. The creation can't manage God's emotions. Right? And so there's that sense of God's transcendence. And, and we want to honor that transcendence and we want to affirm it because it is that transcendence that ultimately wins the victory. Right? The power over death, the power over disease, the power over hurts and wounds. But we don't want to talk about transcendence in a way that subverts God's presence and God's compassion and God's empathy or sympathy with the human condition. 
And sometimes we, we kind of we got to lean to one pole or the other. You know, some people lean toward the transcendent, and some people lean toward what we can call the imminent, that is God's presence in the world and how God is at work in the world and how God relates and communes and um, exists in the world. But we want to hold both of those together. Sometimes we need to emphasize one over the other, for sure, but we want to hold them both together. So in talking about that God cares or God understands, we're really kind of leaning into the sense of God's eminence, that God is present and eminent among us. And ultimately, that's about the story of Jesus. But we don't, need, we don't, we don't want to forget the story of God with Israel because the story of God with Israel is, is a sympathetic God. A God who loves Israel and pursues Israel, calls Israel out among the nations to be the firstborn among the nations, and that this is God's child among the nations, you might say. And God loves this child, and God, even when God is frustrated with them, angry with them, he cannot let go of them. Hosea tells the story about Ephraim, that God loves Ephraim so much, he can't let go of Ephraim. Or Hosea chapter 11, I raised this Israel up as a child. I called my son out of Egypt, right? Hosea 11, 1. And I weaned him, and I helped him, I trained him to walk, and I raised him up, and they rejected me. But God's not going to let go of Israel, even when they reject him. He's going to discipline them, yes, but he's not going to let go of them. He's going to maintain a relationship with Israel. Or the imagery of marriage, that God married Israel. Ezekiel 16 has this big picture about finding this abandoned girl along the roadside and God takes this girl and cares for her, provides for her, dresses her, and marries her. But then this girl finds other partners, becomes an idolater, and God still can't give up on her. Or the story of Hosea and Gomer, right? This is the story of betrayal, but God still loves, and uh, Hosea is to remarry Gomer as a metaphor for how God feels about Israel. So when we're looking, looking at the story of Israel, we see a God who is deeply involved, emotionally connected, eminent within the story, and God has feelings. God has emotions. That's part of that eminence. Israel can't manage God's emotions. That's, they don't have that kind of control over God. God's not codependent, right? But God is emotional in relation to Israel because God is feeling stuff. God knows what it's like to be betrayed. God understands betrayal. God knows what it's like to be rejected because God was rejected by Israel and by others, of course. God knows some of those internal wounds. You know, God has been wounded by humanity. We, even Paul talks about sometimes we grieve the Holy Spirit. We we create pain in the heart of God. Just think about how, how much of a risk God took by creating humanity. Now, when you have children, you create a risk, don't you? Those children may grow up and disappoint you, betray you, hurt you, run away from you, hate you. We hope that doesn't happen, but that's the risk of having children. And so when God chooses Israel, there's a risk that Israel will not respond well to God's initiative. 
And in fact, they didn't often respond well. And that pained God and that grieved God. We see it in the story of the flood, right? That the violence had filled the earth. God wanted to fill the earth with his imagers. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Fill the earth with images of God. Fill the earth with the glory of God. Guess who we are? We are the glory of God as the image of God. And so God wanted to fill the earth with God's glory through people, through imagers. Wanted to fill the land of Israel with glory through what Israel was doing in this new Eden. That's always been God's purpose, God's intent. But when God creates us, God risks that we're not going to respond well to that and that we're going to go our own way. We're going to choose our own path and we're going to create our own story. We're going to create an alternative story, one that doesn't fit what God is interested in or what God's goal is. And it pains God. So that even in the flood, when the earth was filled with violence, God was grieved that the earth was filled with wickedness. God knows emotion. Knows it in God's own way. I don't think we can say that God knows emotion exactly the same way we know emotion. Because our emotions sometimes control us, right? They dominate us and they lead us into some negative attitudes and negative actions and and we get controlled by our emotions. God doesn't get controlled by emotions, but rather God's love is expressed in emotions. So I would want to suggest to you that even in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, God is sympathetic with us. I want to make a distinction here between sympathy and empathy. Now, not everyone's going to buy into this. There there are differences of opinion about this, and psychologists can use these words in different ways. So, you know, there's some technical definitions here that that, uh, uh, would take us in a different direction. But I'm, I'm going to suggest a kind of what I regard as a common sense sort of definition. Sympathy is is a feeling of pathos, passion for another. To be with them in their pathos, in their suffering, in in their emotions. So when we talk about sympathy, we might hear of someone or we know someone in the church or 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 we have a family member that we can sympathize with in the sense that Oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. It's never happened to me. But I'm, I feel sad that it's happened to you. And I'm hurt because you're hurting. Right? That's kind of a feeling of sympathy. But empathy is a little different, it seems to me. Empathy is this sort of thing where, oh... I I know something of what that feels like. Oh, you've lost a child too. Or you've lost a spouse too. Or you've had cancer too. Or you've lost your job suddenly like I did one time. So it's kind of, we have an empathy. We have a shared experience. Not just in general, but but a more specifically shared experience of suffering. In other words, we have suffered a very similar thing. Now, there's a sense in which we all suffer, and so we can all have empathy in that sense, for sure, because we have all suffered. But empathy is also this sort of thing that I can walk in your shoes a little bit, or you're walking in my shoes, that we have a shared experience of some kind, that we know the sort of feelings the sort of rumblings that take place in the heart because of that shared experience. When I think about God in, among Israel, God in the Hebrew Bible, generally, I think about sympathy. 
I mean, God has sympathy for Israel's hunger and thirst in the wilderness. Because God responds to it, right? God gives them manna and God gives them water from the rock. So God, God has sympathy. He can see his people hurting. He can appreciate that they're hurting. He can feel the movement in his own heart to respond to that hurting by providing manna and water. But God has never been hungry. God's never been thirsty. So in, in that sense, you, I hope you got to follow this one carefully here. In that sense, God is sympathetic with Israel, but God is not empathetic with Israel. Now, I wouldn't want to draw an absolute line there. Uh, we, have, we have to be careful. But I'm trying to, uh, hopefully, a distinction is coming across a little bit. Now, there are certain things that God is empathetic with, like God, God knows what it's like to be betrayed. God knows what it's like to have a, sal, a, a, a spouse. I almost said sal, sal, you know, like, like a pig or something. I don't know. Uh, God knows what it's like to have a spouse who betrays God, right? So there are things in which God has empathy, in which God weeps over. Scripture talks about God weeping. Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's laments are often the laments that are in the mouth of God, that God is lamenting Israel. God is grieving over Israel. God is weeping over Israel. Just like Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives looking at Jerusalem does what? Yeah. I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chickens, but you would not. God in Jesus is grieving over Jerusalem. So God has these feelings of grief, just like we do. So there's a real sense in which the God of Israel is also empathetic and not just sympathetic. But here's, here's the real transition. God becomes fully empathetic with humanity through the incarnation the logos becomes flesh in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god then in john 1:14 says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us now, in Israel, God tabernacled among Israel, right? God descended upon the tabernacle and the temple, and God dwelt among Israel in the temple. And so God is present, but this is different, isn't it? This is a tabernacling of God that is not in a building, but in the flesh. And when God comes in the flesh, God has new experiences through the flesh. God had never experienced flesh before, right? Now, God knows what it's like for you to have flesh. God knows your heart. God knows what we think. God knows how we process this. But God had never experienced being in the flesh. Or take the word temptation. This is probably the easiest way to see this. What do we say about God and temptation? God cannot be tempted. You can't tempt God. You can't put a carrot out in front of God and say, hey, come on, God, see about this? You, know, you can't tempt God into doing something. God cannot be tempted. Was Jesus tempted? Yeah. God in the flesh was tempted. The person who took on flesh, the logos, the word, who took on flesh came among us and tabernacled among us and dwelt among us in a way in which now God experiences temptation in the person of Jesus. But that's not all he experienced, right? He experienced thirst hunger, 
fatigue. God never been tired before. God had never experienced temptation. God had never experienced thirst. God had never experienced um, hunger or fatigue. You can't wear God out. But Jesus got fatigue. And so the person who becomes human, this logos, this word that becomes human, that person experiences through the flesh all that we experience. The pains, the stumped toes, the, you know, the, 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 the fingers that are hurt, you know, whatever it is. He experiences all of that. He knows what it's like to stand beside the tomb of a friend. He knows what it's like to be betrayed by a Judas and to be forsaken by the disciples. He knows what it's like to be rejected by people. He knows what it's like to, um, to have a, a following, but then it all dissipates. He knows what it's like to suffer pain and to be thirsty. He knows what it's like to die. All that's new to God. It's not new in terms of cognition. It's not new in terms of, you know, Anne, Anne's hungry. I don't know that she is, but I'm going to just say, but, but Anne, I mean, God knows Anne's hungry. God knows everything. But God hasn't experienced everything. God knows I sin. But God's never sinned. There's a difference between what God knows in terms of kind of cognition and what God has experienced. And in the incarnation, God, in God's love and in God's desire to know us, to know us fully, not just with head knowledge, you might say, but with experiential knowledge, to know us on the inside, not just to know us on the outside. Now, have to be careful with that language because God also knows us on the inside because God is you know, fully aware of what's going on inside of us, right? But in the incarnation, God becomes one of us to know us as one of us. That's a different kind of knowledge. It's an experience. And this is the greatness of God's love. That the one who existed in the form of God, Philippians 2, right? The one who existed in the form of God, it did not consider equality with God something to exploit to his own advantage. That's the new RSV translation, which I think is right. He didn't regard this equality as something to exploit to his own advantage. That is, well, I'm not going down there. <laughs> you know, hey, you, one, of, you know, one of you do that. I'm not going to do that. He didn't exploit it to his own advantage, but he emptied himself. Or he humbled himself. Or he made himself nothing. Or he, it's the word in Greek, kenosis, kineo, to empty, to, to become, to let go of stuff. He acted in a way that said, okay, I'm going to become one of them. And he became a human being. He became a slave in the likeness of human beings, in the form of a human being. And he was obedient under death, even death to the cross. Something earth-shattering happened in that moment. Something new happened to God. God became human. And in becoming human, fully empathizes with us as one of us. See, I think that that's an anchor I need in my life. I've heard this sort of story many times. You, maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've thought it yourself. Maybe you've pursued it. But it's the kind of idea that, that God is so distant to us 
that God cannot understand. And you might, might have a point if you're talking about the Hebrew Scriptures. Maybe you might have a point. I don't know if I want to give it all over to you for that. But, but we have that kind of deep sense that, okay, God doesn't really have, God doesn't appreciate this. God doesn't really understand what I'm going through. But that's the theology of the incarnation that basically says, oh, oh yes, God does. Because God loved us so much that he didn't want to remain an outsider to our experience. He didn't want to just remain a spectator to our experience. He became a full participant in the human condition, a full participant in our experience, so that God, in God's own life, through the incarnation, can experience what we experience, to feel what we feel, to be tempted like we are tempted, to be hungry like we are hungry, and to know the pull of temptation like we feel it. You see, I think that that sense of temptation, when we think about the temptations of Jesus, we have to be careful that we don't make Jesus some kind of Teflon person, you know. I mean, Teflon's not politically correct these days, but you know, we, we get it. You know, it doesn't stick to him, right? It doesn't stick. Like in the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, oh, you know, I'll, if you worship me, I'm going to give you all these kingdoms. It's not like Jesus said, <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah, this is no big deal. No, this is a tug. He became incarnate to become king, right? That's why he came, to be king. And Satan says, I'll make you king without the suffering. You don't have to suffer. I'll, we can handle this. Was that a temptation? Yeah. Or the struggle in the garden, right? The struggle to be obedient. He learned, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He struggled with it. It wasn't just kind of like Jesus walking on the earth and saying, oh, this, is, this isn't hard. <laughs> you know, like, this is easy to be human. No, it was hard for Jesus to be human. It's hard for God to be human. And I think we have to take full account of that that the struggle that Jesus had. So once we recognize that God has become fully empathetic with us, has walked in our shoes, knows our experiences, has experienced the world through human lenses, through human experiences, then we can affirm in the fullest way possible, God understands. No matter what we've experienced, God understands. God knows what it's like. Now, we all have a sense of individual character to our experiences because no experience is exactly like any other experience because we all bring our own background. We bring our own family of origins. We bring our own different experiences in life to, to our moments of suffering. And so I don't think we can say that your experience of suffering is exactly like anybody else's experience of suffering. There are differences. But what we can recognize is that there's a commonality as well. There's a common human condition that we all participate in. And therefore, we can have all, all have a sense of some general empathy in that way, even though we don't have necessarily the same specific moments of suffering or the same history of suffering. But we all participate in human suffering. And in that sense, we are all empathetic. And in that sense, God becoming human, God becomes empathetic as well. 
even though he doesn't have all the experiences of every kind of suffering, he does have the experience of the human condition. Let me remind you of a text that I hope you're familiar with. It's in Hebrews chapter 2. Beginning in verse 14 and reading through the end of the chapter. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood. He himself, talking about Jesus... He himself, the God, the one through whom God created the world. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1 says God has spoken in these last days through his Son, who is the image uh, and the glory, who is the, the very instrument of creation itself. So this divine person through whom God created the world, that this person, he himself, likewise, shared the same things, shared flesh and blood, so that, Through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery to the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, didn't take on the nature of angels, but the descendants of Abraham, human beings. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. In other words, the incarnate God is one who comes alongside of us, doesn't just stand above us, doesn't have this, is not just this transcendent God who is distant and doesn't understand. No, this is the one who became flesh and blood to share life with us, to share the human condition, to come alongside of us, to be tested with us, to be tempted with us. And because he was tested and resisted the temptations, he is one who can now help us in our testing. He's not way up there. He's right here, right here beside us. And that experience, now think about it this way as well, that that experience, I'm going to go a little theological on you here, so, so follow me, all right? The experience of the Son as human being becomes part of the experience of the Father and the Spirit. Because the experience of the Son as human being becomes part of the experience of the Son himself, right? The person of the Son, who is God. And as the person of the Son is fully intimate with the Father and the Spirit, The Son knows the Father, and the Father knows the Son, and the Son, the Spirit knows the the Son, and the Spirit, uh, the Son knows the Spirit. Because there is that intimacy between Father, Son, and Spirit, the experiences of the Son become part of the experiences of God, so that God understands. I think that that is one of the more powerful notions in my life that has been a solid anchor for me. I'm going to tell you a story of when it became that for me. Because I didn't always thought about it this way. This would be when Joshua was about six years old, which would have been like 1990, 91, when we were living in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. I was teaching at a Bible college there for a couple of years. And we had this uh, house on the hill. And this house on the hill, we rented this house. 
His house on the hill overlooked where the school buses were parked. Right? So you could be on the front porch of our house, and we had this great view of all the school buses. You know, kind of like up at the parish house. You know, you know, had this great view. Um, but Joshua loved that view because he just loved school buses for some reason. I have no idea why, but he loved school buses. He could look at those school buses. He'd get all excited about, oh, school bus, school bus. You know. And so he had this, he, he couldn't say a lot of sentences, more when he was younger and less when he was older. But uh, he had this one expression, I want to ride the bus. I want to ride the bus. Right? So when he started his um, kindergarten, um, no, it's first grade. I think this is, no, no, it's, no, first grade, first grade. He got kicked out of kindergarten, by the way. You know, when your kid gets kicked out of of, of kindergarten at the Baptist church, you know something's wrong. Right? And he put toilet paper in the toilets. I didn't teach him that. You know, he came up with that one on his own. Yeah. Um, we actually thought that Joshua was going to be this person we're going to probably have to visit in jail for most of his life. You know, that's, that's kind of <laughs> the image we had of him. He was very uh, hyperactive and very disruptive. He loved to hear things break, which is not a good thing. All right? I mean, we had this back porch with all the, with the, what do you call the, you know, lamps around the back porch so you can see on the back porch at night. And one day he, he's out there on the back porch, got a broomstick and whoosh, And then, you know, he would whoosh, <laughs> And he would just do that, you know, after every, I think he got it from the Wizard of Oz. Uh, because the you know the laugh of the witch and uh, and the breaking of things. Um, so anyway, but this is you know this is who my son was, and um, he, he was always full of joy. You know, at, at that age, in, in later years, a lot of, lot more. Um, um, what's the word I want to use? A um, lot more frustration and pain, but at six, he wanted to ride the bus. So, okay, uh, we'll, we'll make the arrangements and we'll make sure it's safe and, and that he can handle that and that the bus driver knows about this and that school, you know, everybody work, work together in a wonderful way so he could ride the bus. Well, He's done that a couple of weeks. And then one morning, he doesn't want to get on the bus. It's not clear to me why he doesn't want to get on the bus. He doesn't, doesn't say he doesn't want to get on the bus. It's just kind of acting like he doesn't want to get on the bus. But being the good father that I am, you know, I got him on the bus. <laughs> I didn't pay attention to the cues that I was receiving. And I mean he didn't he didn't scream and yell or anything like that about getting on he got on the bus. And I can remember it was a September morning and the windows on the bus were down and as the bus drove away I I heard why he didn't want to get on that bus. I heard the names they were calling my son. Not very nice names. See, Joshua is still wearing diapers. And he used that, the, that diaper in, in an obvious way the day before. And it was called names, apparently. But I heard these names as the bus was driving away. And I became so angry. And I was angry at everybody. I mean, this is everybody's fault, when really it's not everybody's fault, but your anger just kind of takes over. I'm angry at the bus driver. I'm angry at the teacher, even though the teacher had absolutely nothing to do with this. You know, I'm, I'm just angry with everybody, but I know who I was really angry with. I was angry with God. And I went 
you know, we took care of the situation, but, but um, and he didn't ride the bus very often after that. Um, sometimes he wanted to. But that afternoon in my office, I, I shut the door and I spent an hour in angry prayer. I, it was the most angry prayer I have ever prayed. And that, that's saying a lot, <laughs> because I've had some angry prayers, but it was the most I've ever prayed. Why, God? Why, why this? Why, why this pain for my son? Why, you know, you could just hear the kind of questions. Yeah. And I'm, I'm aware that this is terminal for his condition, and I'm, and I'm just angry that this one who is named Joshua is not going to have the life that I had envisioned or hoped for him. And that he's being mistreated by people, by other school kids, basically. Not mistreated by teachers or anything like that, no. And this hasn't happened to me very often, but it did happen to me in this moment. That after about an hour of praying like that, just letting it all out, I wish I could say I actually heard an audible voice. I, I, I don't, I didn't hear an audible voice. It wasn't like something coming, you know, like the sky opening and something like that. But it was a deep sense, deep impression upon my heart which I don't, see how was, I don't see how it would be generated by me because I was in the depth of anger. And so I attribute it to the Holy Spirit groaning with me. And I heard, quote, unquote, God say something like, I understand. They treated my son like that too. And in that moment, I had a, a shift in theology because it helped me see, oh, you do understand. You know what this feels like. I'm not alone. I'm not isolated you're not distant from this feeling that I have, this, this hurt, this pain that I have. You're not way up there somewhere beyond impact. You are impacted by this too. You know what this feels like. And my prayer turned from anger to praise on a dime. I have no explanation for that other than God was working in my heart. I wish God had done it five minutes into the prayer instead of an hour, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know how that works. You know, I don't have any explanation for that one. But from that moment on, I began to think more deeply about, wait a minute, God understands. What does that mean to say God understands? And it is, it was in that moment, and it continues to be one of the great comforting dimensions of my thinking and my experience with suffering. God loves me. God listens to me. God understands as an insider, not as just an outsider, but as an insider. To suffering itself. God entered into, entered into suffering. Not to, only to suffer for us. He suffered because of us as well, right? I think there's an author, an Old Testament scholar author who uses this phrase that God suffered because of us and God suffers for us, but also God suffers with us. God understands. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit 
be with us all. Amen. Yeah, 10.30 on the dot.